Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. And that comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 12. And this is important because humility is the first act in the spiritual life that will get you into fellowship with God. I haven't mentioned much about something my late pastor coined called rebound. Rebound's very easy to remember. He described it as in basketball, if you have the ball go outside of bounds, you have to rebound. The other team gets the ball, rebound, rebound. And it simply means recovery of the spiritual life, but how? 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to, for, and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That's the first act of humility in the Christian way of life. Why? You are naming to God, admitting to God you were wrong. And you say, that doesn't sound that humble. Hey, one of the hardest things in the world for people to do is to admit that they're wrong. And you have to go to Almighty God and say, God, I did this. So it is an act of humility. And so I bring out the fact, and so now, I mean, you have a choice now. You can tell God the Father right now whatever you've done so you can be in fellowship so that you can even understand what I'm about to preach. But it's very important where it says, Now the man Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth, why? Well, at that time, he was claiming the promises of God and mixing them with faith. He had faith. And there are believers who have faith. Now, what is it when a believer has faith? And we understand that an unbeliever believes in Christ. That's an unbeliever who has faith in Christ. But what's a believer's faith? Well, a word had to be coined for that, too. And my late pastor coined the phrase, the faith rest drill. And that's going to be a very important part of your life if you continue with this ministry. The faith rest drill. And you start out simply by claiming the promises of God. The Bible is full of them. And then you mix those promises with faith. Now in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39... 11, or uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, and also Hebrews chapter 10, 11, verse 1, it says this, But we are not shrinking back to ruin. Now I'll stop there just to give you a point of what that means, shrinking back to ruin. Does that have to do with backsliding? No, that's not the context of Hebrews 10, 39. The context is this. Disregarding those things that are behind and pressing onward toward those things that are ahead, toward the high ground of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with not hanging on to guilt. Did you sin last night? Probably. None of my business, I'm just saying. You as a believer, you sin. We, we have studied that in, con in some context, possibly in the video messages, but definitely in my ministry at www.aelewisministries.org. We've studied how you disregard those things that are behind. I've sinned, uh, sometimes I've sinned and... Uh, ten minutes later, I've forgotten about it because I know God has forgiven it. And I know that I am to disregard it. And I don't even think about it again. Now, the people around me might bring it up three days later and have, but that's people. And then you have to disregard it again, and then you might have to, in humility, say, Father, I got angry with that person because they brought up something he forgave. A long time ago when you weren't even thinking about it. 
But what it means when it says, but we are not shrinking back to ruin, it's saying, you're not looking back at the failures of your life. There's no time to look back. There's only time to look forward. And since when have you gone anywhere looking backwards? I'll tell you where. A lot of people looking backwards, driving in their cars, run smack, ruck, dab into something. You look forward. Move forward. Keep going. That is the meaning of Hebrews 4 or Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not shrinking back to ruin. And that, that ruin, now that's, that's a word that really should hit home. When you go into a guilt complex and you perseverate or continue to think about your past sins and failures, you're ruined your spiritual life is ruined. Now people look at the outward appearance and they look at how you act and they may say, you're ruined. But they may not know. Because God looks on the heart. They see inside. He looks at our thinking because you are what you think. He doesn't look at our outward or those overt things that oftentimes people can point to and say ruin. Ruin is what, what you do to yourself. Ruin is guilt, guilt complex. But we are not shrinking back to a guilt complex failure of our spiritual life in the past. But by faith possessing the soul. Faith possessing the soul. That's why my late pastor coined it, faith, rest, drill. We are possessed with it. Then it goes on to say, now faith is the essence, which means the actual being or reality of those things being hoped for. Now that's not the best of translation. And I know that because the word hope in the English language is meaningless. You can attach to the word hope whatever you like. Your own agenda. Well, it's like a painter having a... My mom's a, a painter. And you have... What do you have where, where, where you have this blank sheet and now you're going to... Canvas? Is that what they yes. call it? A canvas. I'm losing my head. A canvas. And so here you have this canvas right in front of you. And with the word hope in the English language, we almost interpret it as it's a canvas and we can put on it whatever we want and that's our hope. That's our own agenda. We've had politicians, and not just one, and I'm not naming just one, we've had politicians since the beginning of time who've come out and used the word hope. I will bring hope, they say. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say Barack Obama, he's my president and my authority. Bill Clinton used it a lot. He is now out of office. And Bill Clinton said in his 92 bid for election, which he won, I will bring hope and change. You might not remember that, but that's what he said. And he used it quite often. Hope and change. And what did people do with the word hope? They assign to it all of their aspirations, all of their desires, everything that they ever want in life, they put in one word called hope. But that's not the meaning of hope. The meaning of hope in the Bible is Elpis in the Greek, not Elvis. Elvis has left the building, but, but Elpis has not. Elpis is confidence correctly translated confidence and that's often misconstrued as arrogance but don't worry about that and if you have confidence you won't oh I can't tell you how many times my confidence has been misconstrued as arrogance and how even probably some of my arrogance has been misconstrued as oh isn't he so sweet no I'm so arrogant you see it's a confidence is what I'm getting at. But by faith possessing the confidence. Now faith 
is the essence, which means the actual being or reality, of things being hoped for, or better translated, of things you have confidence in. Where's your confidence? Is your confidence in a politician? It better not be. There's an election today in South Carolina. Is my hope or confidence all wrapped up in who wins tonight? No. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to see who wins. I'm going to have my own comments and opinions. That's normal. But whoever wins, I'm not going to, I'm going to fall apart and go cry about it. If the person wins that I don't like winning, I'll just go play a computer game. Big deal, whoop de doo life goes on, Jesus Christ controls history. Now in Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, it admonishes us to look at the Exodus generation because the Exodus generation as a group of believers lacked faith. In other words, they did not use the faith rest drill. So in Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, let us fear. While a promise remains of entering into his rest, that any of you should come short of it. Now you're starting to see why my late pastor coined the word faith rest drill. It's in the Bible, that's why. Therefore, let us fear while a promise remains of entering into his rest, that any of you should come short of it. For indeed, we have the good news proclaimed to us, as they did also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because those who heard it did not mix it with their faith. For we have believed and entered the rest. Rest. Isn't that a beautiful word? In psychology, when I was in school, they actually asked a group of us, both male and female together. And if you don't think males and females are different, just go to that psychology class. You'll find out in a hurry. There's a huge difference. And they, may, they asked the question. They said, the, the, the uh, professor said, if I, if I could do away with sleep, and no one could sleep ever, and you don't need sleep, you wouldn't want sleep, you wouldn't care about sleep, uh, you would not get tired. You would not get fatigued. You could always be awake. You could always be at the highest point of alertness. If you could choose to do that, or if you could choose to continue to have those periods of rest, what would you choose? Well, all the women raised their hand when they said, would you choose to sleep? Every one of the women raised their hand, rest. So you ladies listening to me, you should start to understand this much more quickly than the men. And take that as a compliment. Because men sometimes have a harder time resting. We want to do something. We're on the go. We've got stuff to do. We've got the world to change. We're, we're here to turn the world upside down. And, and then the little ladies, bless their hearts, they're ready to go rest. Well, bless you. Sometimes I'm ready to go rest. But what does it mean? For we have entered the rest. Rest is a beautiful word. We need it. If I don't get it enough, I'll get ill and you won't be able to hear me speak for a week or so. Rest is a rejuvenation of the body. We need it as, as and now we need it. We won't need it in the resurrection body. But we need it and we need at least as a man six to eight hours I work better off of eight and as a woman eight to nine hours according to medicine don't jump on me you feminist the, the medical doctor says so so we have entered the rest now this rest that doesn't have to do with sleep this rest here is dealing with the generation of the Jews it's dealing with the Exodus generation that Moses had to lead. And earlier I read to you that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And now I'm reading to you from Hebrews 
that the people couldn't enter his rest. They didn't identify with Moses. They're going to have to when the Red Sea splits, but right at this point, they're not identifying with Moses. They're not resting. Moses is completely at peace. Why? Something called faith rest drill, which we will continue to study because there's no way I can give this information out in 20 minutes and have you understand it. The rest for the Jews was to get into the land. Now that was the whole point of Hebrews 4.1. But the rest for you and me is to be free from worry, anxiety, and emotional sins. Do you know how many people, how many believers, not just people, I've seen unbelievers handle situations better than believers. Do you know how many believers are running off of anxiety? Now I'm not going to downgrade you and say you're going to have to take your anxiety pill. Do it. And uh, if the doctor's giving it to you, take it. There are cer certain, certain, very specific situations where there's a chemical imbalance to where your brain is running like a gerbil on a wheel and nothing will stop it except medicine. And so I'm not downing medicine. I'm just saying that it comes from a thinking. You say, but are you saying doctrine doesn't work? Of course doctrine works. And of course doctrine gives you rest. The problem is most believers will never do it. And so those believers who go into anxiety and are about to lose their brains they need medicine to function, period, over and out. That's the case. So, the rest for you is to be free from worry, free from anxiety, free from all the emotional sins, which we'll study at some point, all of them. Fear, for one. Now, verse 2 addresses the question of after salvation, what? What? That is verse 2 of Hebrews 4. Therefore let us fear while a promise remains of entering into his rest that any of you should come short of it. Now that's written definitely to those who have already believed. So verse 2 addresses the question of after salvation as what? And the Exodus generation under Moses, the most humble man on the face of the earth, which by the way, the Exodus generation looked at Moses and they said, he's the most arrogant man on the face of the earth. But God looked at Moses and said, he's the most humble man on the face of the earth. Someone asked me the other day, do you worry about people's perceptions and how people perceive you? And I said, no. Just matter-of-factly. And that was it. I didn't go into an explanation because they wouldn't have understood it. But if it hadn't been in an environment where I had to maintain a professionalism, I would have said, no, I only care as to how God perceives me. And when I'm out of fellowship, I don't even care how he perceives me. And that's arrogance, but that's being out of fellowship for you. And people do it. You go off your own agenda. Don't sneer at me and be like, ooh, that's a bad thing to say. Sure it is. But we've all done it. Anytime you go off your own agenda, you're saying, I don't care how God perceives me. I'm going to do what I want. So what this is dealing with is the fact that verse 2 address, addresses the issue of after salvation. What? What do you do? And the Jews are believers, but they don't know what they're doing. Moses is trying to t teach them what to do, but they won't listen to Moses because they say, Moses, you're arrogant. But Moses was humble. Now that's perception for you. And that's why I almost got irritated when I heard the question, don't you care about how you're perceived by people? Because I know the story of Moses being the most <coughs> humble man on the face of the earth, and I know how he was perceived as arrogant by people. So no, I don't care what you think of me. And it sounds callous. I care about you, but I don't care what you think about me. 
I might care what you think about a situation and have a conversation with you, but I don't care what you think about me. I care what God thinks. And this is a good illustration of that because here's Moses, humble. And here's a bunch of people, two million, and popular belief would have, you know, if they had elections during the Exodus generation, you know what would have happened? Moses would have lost in a landslide. He'd have gotten two votes, Caleb and Joshua. So whoever gets two votes tonight, probably Herman Cain, who's not even running, well, Moses would have gotten two votes. Now we'll continue with this study. I have to quit this thing now because of the time limitation. And we will continue with the Faith Rest Drill. If you're interested in learning more, there is some on the Faith Rest Drill on the www.aelewisministries.org uh, website under the newcomer site. And I will be posting more because I do have some missing there.